Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first add my own warm welcome to everyone attending this ceremony. It's really a great privilege and honor for us to have you all here. You know, and I'd like to thank uh, Nancy, uh, Michael, who just departed, Victor, you know, uh, for all the remarks that preceded you know, uh, what I'm going to say, which means I don't have to say very much, <laughs> it's all being said. Having said that, you know, when, um, when, the, when the school asked me to say something, you know, the only advice they gave me was that, don't make it too political. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think the big elephant in the room, as far as supply chains are concerned, is really the geopolitical situation that we're facing today. So unfortunately, I'm going to put on my, uh, my I pretend to be an academic and have freedom of speech. Uh, so I'm not, I hope nobody's going to hold this against the company, because really, it's not a matter of saying who's right or who's wrong, but how to deal with the realities on the ground. And I think that really, the, the reality on the ground and the big elephant in the room is the geopolitical situation that we're all facing today. You know, uh, I don't think we're at a more tumultuous time than now in terms of uh, global supply chains and our whole business, and in fact, all global trade in general. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, people say that the mo most important bilateral relationship in the world is between the United States and China. And frankly, for uh, global supply chains, that holds absolutely true as well. So there are many things I can talk about in terms of impacting the global supply chain. Technology, for example, impacts all businesses. But that's, a, uh, although very fast, moving very fast, this is still an evolutionary process. You know, and then, of course, you know, as uh, Victor mentioned, you know, our, our firm, which is 118 years old this year, have been dealing with world trade and global supply chains ever since we started, but it was an evolution. What we see now actually is a fairly, uh, I would say, uh, abrupt brick in what we've been used to for the last 40 or 50 years that, that, I, that I've been back in and doing business. Uh, let me start first with the um, US-China relationship. And I think that really set the stage for modern uh, supply chains. Because it's really after Richard Nixon's visit to China in 1972 that the, the world's two, now the two biggest economies in the world, really had a detente and trade started flowing. I don't think that, uh, that moment can be underestimated in the way that uh, the, the role that these two relations, this relationship between these two great countries have in terms of promoting globalization at that time. It was also a great year because 1972 was the year I came back to work in Hong Kong. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was the beginning of my career in Hong Kong. But in any case, you know, uh, we, knew, we all know what followed. You know, following the 1972 meeting between Richard Nixon, Kissinger, you know, and, and, uh, and the, the detente with Mao Zedong, the Chinese government, then we followed with Deng Xiaoping's opening up of China, 1979. Again, another tremendous e event that set the stage for the, the economic miracle of China that we all, that we all know. In fact, everyone in the room probably experienced it in one way or the other. Um, the opening up of China in uh, 1979 then subsequently led to uh, such a burst of activity. 1.4 billion people at that time joined the world's workforce. It's a complete disruption to world trade flows, you know, for the better, I would say, as, as we can look back now and say that those were the golden years of global supply chains. And, and those golden years, you know, really lasted about 40 years. You know, and uh, that was the period where uh, we built our company. That's the period where the world got together. That was the period where the world was flat, according to Friedman. And when Victor and I wrote our book, we actually named our book Competing in a Flat World. Unfortunately, the world is not so flat anymore. Um, you know, when, when we look at the challenges that we're facing today, I really think that it, uh, the origins of, of that really, I would say, started in 1907-08. Uh, okay, that was the global financial crisis. And, and what started wasn't the, uh, wasn't the crisis itself, but I think uh, China fared well. They fared very well during that, uh, that crisis. You know, I think, um, and I think that led to a change in situation between the balance of political and other perceptions and power in the world. In 1907-08, China did very well that I think it led somewhat to a, a lot of confidence in China in terms of its role in the world. And as a result, it became, uh, I would say, more assertive. You know, 
I wouldn't use the word hubris, but there was, certainly was a lot of confidence in that China was doing the right thing, its system was, was correct, that it, would, uh, do it. it was basically a, a, a big change in the perception that China had of the rest of the world and probably of the world, especially the United States, on China. I think that was the period where um, China started its, uh, in, in its 14-5 uh, year plan. Uh, in, uh, they, they basically had this idea of, uh, of a made in China 2025. And for China to announce that it has intentions over this five year plan to dominate the world in all the new technologies and businesses, you know, the, the green economy, the, the green energy, the change in energy, you know, all the things of quantum, it, it's, I think it was a, a bit of a shock to a lot of other countries around the world. Along with that, then you've coupled it with a confidence overflowing into, you know, into uh, being called, you know, the, the diplomacy being wolf warriors, you know, and so on. And I think that really provoked a reaction from the, the, the dominant world power at that time, the United States. And that's when we went into the Trump era. And as you know, the Trump era was a beginning of a really a very changed dynamic in the whole world. Of course, it's been brewing for a while. Of course, you know, America realizes that China is coming up fast and China is looking for perhaps its rightful place in the world. But more importantly, I think uh, the United States now is now reacting to it. And with uh, Mr. Donald Trump, you know, we had the, uh, the uh, first of all, uh, as you know, there was, there was a bit of change in America's own attitude with the rest of the world. America in, uh, withdrew from the, the uh, TPP. You know, amongst other things, I'm just focusing on the trade area. And, uh, and of course, the, then the, uh, the, the Section 301 punitive duties against China became, began, began to set in. 25% tariffs. You know, the, the use of tariffs has been, was, has been universally denounced by ac the academic community for, for decades. And that seems to be, however, uh, Mr. Trump, Trump's favorite countermeasure you know, to the rise of China. And, uh, and that obviously changed the dynamics of the relationship between uh, America and China quite fundamentally. And there was hope at the end of the Trump presidency that uh, with the Biden presidency, that there might be a change. Unfortunately, uh, that did not happen. I think uh, for all kinds of reasons, you know, again, you know, I'm not gonna say who's right, who's wrong. The, the uh, Biden administration basically carried on with the Trump uh, attitude towards trade and China in particular. And uh, the tariffs were continued. Not only that, but I think the Biden administration added on sanctions. You know, I think some of us in this room were, you know, were, were affected very much by sanctions, which was much more specific, non-tariff barrier that is even more uh, difficult to counter. You know, as all our, our, uh, my friends and all the professors would say, you know, and here we were operating, we, I'm a practitioner, we were operating for 40 years under the aegis of uh, David Ricardo that the reason why we have efficient supply chains is because of comparative advantage, because we economically, you know, we can do things better, faster, et cetera. You know, that, uh, that, uh, that, that was the way that the existing supply chains were built based on practical, practical, the practical dimensions of efficiency, you know, and for the great benefit of the world. I think nobody would dispute that those years of uh, globalization in, in, uh, for the world were very good for everyone, of course, including China especially. You know, the lifting of the millions and millions of people out of poverty. You know, the, uh, and, and I would say that that was the period where uh, uh, my firm, Lee and Fung, built this business and uh, around the idea of uh, efficient supply chains, quick response, you know, uh, going to the best places in the world uh, where, where uh, where it should be, where production should be uh, done, going to the place in the world where raw material should be taken out of the ground, etc. It, it was a very comfortable world for expeditions that, you know, that we, this is something we know about, we can do it. You know. And then even the impact of technology, we can still see that coming. What we didn't see coming, of course, was the whole geopolitical dimension. You know, and we realized uh, with this change in, in the relationship between the two world's greatest economies, that the world was not, no longer flat. So we're now at that point where uh, uh, what can we do about it and what's going to happen? Let me first start with a scenario where uh, I think, I think what, what we see happening, and I'd like to pick up 
on where Victor left off, which is really now the um, the smooth the, uh, the smooth evolution of uh, and fast evolution of supply chains, you know, based on, on on real economics, based on real you know efficiencies and so on, are now given way to a great extent to navigating all the obstacles that's been put in the way of uh, of, uh, of global supply chains because of the rivalry between the great powers. Uh, we really have a have a, I like to say one of the trends, I like to identify for everyone a trend that we see happening that will affect the whole world, and it has to do with Victor's point about indirect trade. And the other one is Hong Kong's role, you know, very quickly, Hong Kong's role. Later on, you know, we have many speakers, including the panel and the how, you know, we'll we, we look at this and some of our very bright professors from uh, Hong Kong UST will talk about some of the ramifications of that, including other factors like technology. But let, let, me, let me just, because of the limited time I have, just focus on the biggest thing that I have to contend with. You know, um, we, we, basically, um, we, we basically went through a period of the world where uh, the supply chains were built on, as I said, on efficiency and, and not around the obstacles imposed by political will. And so, you know, I would say that during that period, uh, during that period, uh, the world benefited. In fact, America benefited. All the recipients, the Western world, uh, uh, benefited. One of my most fond sayings is that when I first started working with the Gap stores in 1980, uh, they were selling jeans for $28 a pair. Today, they are selling jeans for $28 a pair. <laughs> if you go to Old Navy, it's $18 a pair. That's the benefit of global trade in terms of, of uh, helping the standard of living really around the world. So it's not one side lose, the other side gains. It's really a mutually beneficial situation. So we, you know, we're now at a point where uh, uh, the realities that we are facing is that there are a lot of obstacles. And uh, one of the impacts uh, is, of course, on uh, America as the greatest trading power and maybe uh, uh, manufacturing power in the world today is that they will be very much impacted. Especially uh, daunting and perhaps uh, 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 scary is the uh, pronouncements of the two candidates now coming up to the American elections. You know, uh, uh, Donald Trump is Donald Trump and, uh, and uh, Biden rematch. And they're talking about things like, you know, 60% duties, maybe more. And of course, uh, Mr. Biden recently came through, you know, with something that uh, I thought, I don't know if you realize how, how uh, disruptive this sort of statement is. 100% duty of electric vehicles, which one, America doesn't really produce and doesn't even import. You know, it's a preemptive tariff on something that's never happened yet. You know, I don't know if you guys seen this movie about you know, preventing crime that's happening in the future. You know, this, is sort of, this is sort of that kind of scenario. It's really kind of scary. I could see that if things are bad and, and the trade deficit uh, comes out and there's a need, for, and, and going back to the, the academics idea of things like protecting infant industries in your country, Okay, and then, and then the, the traditional definition of dumping, I think we can deal with all that. We know how to deal with that. But to a preemptive tariffs against something that is, hasn't happened yet, I mean, that is really something new. And I think that's really something that we should be very concerned about. But anyway, so it is scary going forward. And in fact, I would say that uh, as an operating company, and as I, I always look at myself as an operator, uh, not, not, as a, not as an academic, is that the, the, the one question that I give to the next generation who's running the, the, the company now, you know, Spencer and Joseph and, and, and his, his whole team, is that what will we do if those tariffs and all those threats really come in? Every, every company should have a contingency plan because it's not that far away. November is not that far away. And anything that is promulgated you know, by the new administration will impact us for sure in 2025 and beyond. And I would say for, uh, I don't know how long, I hope it won't be that long, or for a number of years. But I think, I think it has everything to do with the, 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 the terms that have been bandied about. You know, for example, you know, the reason why I think this geopolitical uh, uh, focus is so important is because the geopolitics is a, really a decision by governments that could be changed or intensified overnight. You know, and, and therefore, you really have to plan. For example, you know, you know that all the terms they were talking about when they were uh, countering China's rise in the world and so on, the things like, uh, uh, things like uh, um, uh, t taking your trade and look at it as reshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, okay? All of that, okay, must have a fundamental economic underpinning, otherwise it won't last. 
why would you put up a factory, for example, in the United States, if suddenly one administration says that, okay, it's okay now, we don't have these 60% punitive duties or whatever, you end up with an obsolete factory in America that it doesn't conform to any economic principles or why it should be there. You know, so for all those reasons, you know, I think we're now entering a part of the time you know, with, with supply chains where we need a lot of thinking about how we're going to formulate the supply chains of the future. Now, one, one area that I'd like to go a little bit more specific into is, is really China's response. Okay, it's very clear that you know, these unilateral actions by, by the major importing country and perhaps with uh, other you know, uh, like-minded countries you know, that, that comprises the major markets for a lot of China's, uh, uh, China's uh, exports you know, have to be dealt with. You know, when, when I talked about uh, the, um, the impact of uh, Made in China 2025 and so on, okay, I think the first reaction from uh, China and the Chinese government was that, well, is it really that serious? Do we care? You know, we have a very large domestic market. We have 350 million to 400 million middle class, which is the size of America. Why would we be so concerned? Okay, and then, and then you know that uh, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping, you know, uh, talked about this concept of uh, the dual circulation, internal circulation, external circulation. The internal circulation surely must be robust and strong enough to carry us through this. Well, it seems like now after a few years of reacting that way, uh, it, it's, it, it has not, the, the domestic uh, consumption has not picked up the way, the way that uh, I think the Chinese government hoped it will. Uh, coupled then with the problems of uh, indebtedness and, uh, and the real estate problems, okay, that, the, the relying on the internal circulation to basically see China through this period of difficulty is going to be uh, not, it has not worked so far. So guess what, we're now back to the external, the external circulation. And the external circulation, you know, as far as, uh, as foreign direct investments concerned, you know, same thing as trade. Big curtailment of uh, investments by, by the, on America, on, on the investments into China and from China into the United States. You know, CFIUS and so on, you know, many of you are familiar with these concepts. So I think we're back to trade again. You know, and if you look at trade, although, you know, we talk a lot about the rise of uh, the rest of the world in terms of consumption, the real consumption still for the next five, 10 years is still the United States and Western Europe because there the consumption is organized. It's organized accessible consumption. That's where you deal with you know, 40 or 50 of the large companies in America, you've got that consumption market. Contrast that with India, which may be a very big market, but it's you know, 20 million small wholesalers and retailers, not accessible yet. So we're back to now, how do you deal with uh, the uh, the, the, the big markets of U US and Europe, if you're a Chinese manufacturer. So what we predict, what we see happening is really what Victor referred to is an exodus of um, world-class Chinese manufacturers, okay, to really transform their manufacturing base okay, from the China to third countries. Okay, and, it's, uh, and if you think about it, you know, it's really, it, it's, I'm, I'm actually, in a pessimistic scenario, I'm actually quite optimistic that this move actually is to the benefit of almost all the stakeholders you know, in world trade. Let me, let me enumerate them. First of all, for the Chinese, for the Chinese side, let's talk about the, uh, the, the, uh, the Chinese companies. First of all, a lot of these Chinese companies have been supplying the US and Western markets with state-of-the-art, you know, basically world-beating you know, uh, production you know, and so on. And, and they basically need to keep the US and the European markets going to sustain that. And, but they've been forced now to move probably earlier than they hope. But the demographics were already against them staying. You know, as, you, as, as many of you know, especially the practitioners of, of uh, international trade and, and, and supply chains know, okay, a lot of times you're the victim of young success. When I first came back in Hong Kong in 1972, my friends asked me, at that time Hong Kong was relying on exports a lot of labor-intensive exports you know, to, to, um, to America and the rest of the world. And they say, William, why do you come back? You know, we're finished here. Our wages are too high. And then they say, it's all gone to Taiwan. So for sure, I talked to our customers, and we, we went to Taiwan, and we started an operation in Taiwan in order to capture that business. And guess what? My own new staff came to me after six months and said, you know, Mr. Fong, we don't know why you've come to Taiwan. We're finished here. Everything's gone to Korea. 
you know, and then they go to Southeast Asia. So it's a movable feast, and China's no exception. You know, the last time I talked to a, a manufacturer in Shanghai, you know, recent, quite recently, uh, he said, you know, Mr. Fung, we can't compete with the Bangladeshis and the Pakistanis of this world. So it's happening, but it was a much slower as the evolutionary, we could deal with it. Now this is an abrupt break, and we need to move very quickly. So what I, what I think is that the, 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 Chinese, the Chinese factories that's been top of this game is going to move. And they're going to move, they will be an exodus. It will be a, 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 a big move. And, and they will be setting up plants in other parts of Southeast Asia, South Asia, maybe all the way to Africa, you know, maybe even close to the big markets like Mexico. You probably read about this all the time in the news. You know, so as far as I'm concerned, okay, that, that diaspora of Chinese manufacturing power and expertise will continue. And that's the way that they will survive this. And it's not bad. In terms of, of what, if you can imagine, these factories, although they, they are moving and they have to move, and maybe it is going to be troublesome and, 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 and more costly for them in, in the beginning, eventually they will be, have established manufacturing bases in some of the fastest growing developing markets of the world. First to do exports to America and to Europe, but later on maybe to supply the domestic market. So in the long term, it's really not bad for this stakeholder. Now what about China, the state as a stakeholder? Well, you know that uh, there's a lot of talk for many years now about the Belt and Road Initiative. China has invested trillion, they, the, the, their, their own estimates about, uh, 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 what is it, a trillion, a, a trillion uh, 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 RMB. You know, it's probably more like uh, a trillion US dollars. But there's not a, lot, not a lot to show for it. It's always government directed, everything else. So you can imagine that if, uh, if, if, if uh, this diaspora starts to happen, the natural movement of these factories will be along the Belt and Road. Okay, you'll be using the capacity and the technology, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, infrastructure that's been built up by the BRI, by the Belt and Road Initiative. And it'll be a very simple, it'll be, it'll be a very simple thing for, for, for them to be able to use this infrastructure. And now the benefits of, uh, of uh, the BRI will really be apparent, okay, to, to China as well as other, other countries. On top of that, Okay, I think what you will see is a rise in China of the, uh, of the what I call the zhongqi, the, the medium-sized companies who are really the backbone of uh, China's export uh, machine. And, and the rise of these small, specialized, world-class, you know, middle-sized companies will create a new backbone for China in terms of going forward. I liken it to something like the Mittelstand in, uh, in Germany. If China have many of these, you know, thousands and thousands of these middle stand companies that have operations, world-class operations in, in the, the de developing countries, you could imagine how much more resilient and sustainable that ecosystem is instead of just a couple of new Jack Ma's, you know, very big. Okay, and I think it fits better with the whole uh, political philosophy of a socialist country like China is to have this big, big uh, mass of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, middle-sized companies. So that's, for that uh, stakeholder, I think it's, it works and it's very good. And then what about the host countries? The host countries will now get uh, knowledge transfer, manufacturing knowledge transfer from China, which is at the top of their pr uh, production power. Okay, although you may say that, well, they may be doing the more labor-intensive stuff and so on, but eventually that would come. Don't forget the migration of supply chains. You know, when China first opened up, guess what, they only supplied labor. You remember the special economic zones along the coast? We brought the, the raw materials from Korea, Japan, you know, uh, China, uh, Taiwan, everywhere into China. But eventually the supply chain moved into China. So along with this diaspora, you're going to see now a movement of these supply chains out of China. But first, the first parts will be the, the country of origin conferring, the part that Victor alluded to. It will be legal under WTO rules at least. It will be ab absolutely legal. And it would be using still a lot of China's original upstream supply chain inside China. So they're not losing that much. They could still use China's incredible supply chain system that they've been built up in the last 40 years you know, to supply now the, 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 the factory floors, which might be in other countries around the world. You know, so I think that, uh, that as, far as, uh, as far as the host countries are concerned, they get this knowledge transfer, they do exports, they uh, have employment, a lot of employment. Uh, 
a lot of these industries, at least when I was doing it in things like apparel and so on, is the first rung of the development ladder of a lot of these economies as they transition from uh, agricultural to a manufacturing economy. And so they'll get a lot of that kind of employment. Okay, and on top of that, uh, they will earn foreign exchange. You know, what's there not to like, you know, about this, this diaspora? So I think that, that uh, stakeholder would be very much on side with this move. So with all, with, with these, with all these stakeholders really, I think, um, uh, benefiting from this diaspora, we actually predict that this will be the next big wave. In fact, uh, with the BRI, we, we would call this the second wave, BR4 of, uh, of, the, of the Belt and Road Initiative, the second wave. Now, coming back to Hong Kong, okay, as, uh, as uh, <laughs> Nancy talked about, Michael talked about, Victor talked about this, you know, Hong Kong is in the perfect position to be the platform for this diaspora of Chinese companies and manufacturers moving out. Okay, we have the people, very important. You know, the big difference between, for example, Singapore and Hong Kong is that Singapore never went through this phase of, uh, of manufacturing development and working with China that the Hong Kong you know, people have. You know, I, I agree with Michael, this injection of uh, new immigrants is quite incredible. I mean, these are all that we have the talent now you know, of, of, of uh, supporting this kind of platform. We certainly have the, um, we certainly have the uh, financial infrastructure. You know, the uh, trade finance will come into play as the supply chains get more stretched again. When the supply chains were all in China, okay, international trade finance did not play a role because everything is done domestically. But now the supply chains are stretched out again between China on the upstream and the, and the rest of the, of the manufacturing world. Okay, the whole area, the whole plethora of, of, of international trade finance needs to come into place. Together with our expertise on things like trade insurance, you know, I mean, the, uh, the Hong Kong ECIC, the, uh, the Sino Show in China, will all have, have to play a role in this sort of re re regeneration of trade to indirect trade. And there'll be a lot of uh, need for this sort of, uh, of financial services. So a couple, of, and one, by the way, one of the things that, that people have forgotten about is that the, uh, the, the trading, the export trading and commercial sector is as big as the financial sector in Hong Kong, each accounting for about 20% of uh, Hong Kong's GDP. And in fact, in terms of employment, it's more, you know, the, the, the trading community in Hong Kong accounts for more employment in Hong Kong than the financial sector. So anyway, but these are two pillars, two of our main pillars of our economy. I think we'll, we'll, we'll be, have a tremendous impact from this move, you know. And then the last and not the least is our intellectual firepower. You know, I think Victor's always fond of saying that whenever he talks to academics in China, they will say that, oh, we have some great universities. Number one is Beida, you know, Tsinghua, so on. And guess what? They forgot about our Hong Kong. Hong Kong is part of China, right, as, they, as everyone keeps saying. They forget all about our, our, our tertiary institutions in, 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 in China. You know, we are part of China, and we are amongst the top in the world. If anything, you know, I, think, I think this is something that, that uh, is now, we will hopefully see a uniting of uh, this. You know, it's really all these aspects I talked about. And then I think that if, if I were, you look at Hong Kong as a platform you know, to go out, you know, given our legal system, our financial system, and the least of which is maybe even the, the low tax the jurisdiction that we have. You know, for all those reasons, Hong Kong presents a language, you know, and so on, the, the talent. You know, Hong Kong presents the ideal base. And within, within Hong Kong, you know, I think uh, we're very so happy to partner with Hong Kong UST. We think that this is the, uh, at least one of many, you know, uh, the, the tertiary institutions that will be very much providing us with the intellectual power, firepower you know, and, and in terms of, uh, of basically having the knowledge and, and pushing the frontier of the knowledge of uh, supply chain management. And of course, uh, you know, in the end, uh, we're also talking about teaching. We also talk about educating, you know, our compatriots in China who needs to go out for training, executive training and so on. All that is ideal, Nancy. And we're looking forward for this institution to play all those roles that we never had when we had this think tank, you know, on supply chains within the company. So I hope that has not been too boring. Uh, when, when, I, when I first, when they first say, make some remarks about supply chains, I said, what could be more boring than talk about supply chains? But anyway, thank you so much.